Thank you very much, uh, Claire and Carrie. Um, it's a privilege to be with you. I'm humbled uh, to be with you here as we begin this. It sounds like a menu of great offerings. I'm intrigued by bookmaking because I love Santa Anita and Del Mar. So I. Uh, uh, <laughs> Let me stay there a kind of an extra amount of time. Um, you know, the, the, what, what's the keynote anyway? I, I know the title that Claire has uh, saddled me with is a life in service, and, and uh, it sounds uh, more self-absorbed than I want to be about uh, my own life or my own service. I, I think the point of uh, gathering and having somebody speak at the beginning is, is to really talk about uh, how, how do we remind and return, remind ourselves who we are, and uh, find ourselves returned to ourselves in the process. Uh, it's supposed to be, I think, invitational. Uh, we all love LA. We have a passion for what we do, and uh, we want to imagine something different. But we want to really imagine a different community uh, and aspire to something, uh, a vision that's larger uh, than uh, we currently have, let's say. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. But none of us want to wait with our arms crossed and tapping our feet and staring at our watches. We want to make something happen. And I want to suggest that this morning as sort of the, the goal of service and the goal of all that we do, that in the end, the hope is that we want to create a community of kinship such that God might, in fact, recognize it. Uh, the great poet, um, Mary Oliver, writes, there are some things you can't reach, but you can reach out to them, and all day long. And that's what we're going to reach out for today and tomorrow, and then in our lives that continue after this uh, sacred time together. It's a sense of kinship. Mother Teresa, I think, diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. Uh, so this is a nice moment of connection and of kinship that we celebrate in a concrete way. No us and them, just us. Uh, the city uh, can't move forward unless it's a, there is a sense of profound kinship. In the end, no kinship, no justice, no matter how hard you focus on justice. No kinship, no peace, no matter how laser-beamed focus you have on peace. It's about we're in this together. It's about imagining a circle of compassion and then imagining nobody standing outside that circle. That has to be the goal of all that we do. And to that end, all of us, I think, are invited to stand at the very edges of that circle with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, however we can do it, with those whose burdens are more than they can bear, with those whose dignity has been denied. And with any luck, we get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. Even luckier, with the demonized, so that the demonizing will stop. And with the disposable, so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. This is the goal of anybody with passion, it seems to me, in a city that we love is that we long for a compassion that can stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. You know, there was that book years ago, uh, Everything of Importance I Learned in Kindergarten or whatever that thing was. Well, anything of value that I've learned in the last 25 years has been from, from gang members. Uh, they taught me so much and have returned me to myself. Um, uh, lately, you know, they, they've been teaching me texting, which I'm really grateful for. I, uh, I have no idea what we did before. You, know, you start to forget what did we do before we texted, you know, and it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people, you know. So, uh, so I'm quite good, you know, BTW, LOL, OMG. I can do that with my eyes uh, uh, folded. Um, and there's a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. And I've been using that one quite a bit lately. Um, so I'm in a, in a car with a, a Manuel and Boncho, and we're driving to Palm Springs to speak to a high school. And so we, they work at Homeboy Industries down the block here. And, and so we met at the office at 9, and, and then we 
uh, took off on our two hour trek to Palm Desert. And while we're driving, Manuel gets, has an incoming text, you know, and I can hear that zzz, and he reads it, he sort of chuckles. I go, what is it? Oh, it's stupid, it's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, we just left Snoopy, uh, you know, half hour before, and I had greeted him in the morning. I said, what's he say? Oh, let's see. Hey dog, it's me Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest Vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we died, died laughing. And then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. You know, service is the beginning, but I wouldn't want to suggest that service is, in fact, the ballroom. It isn't. It's the hallway that leads to the ballroom. It's a good start. Don't end there. Because there's always a certain kind of distance in service. You want to end in a sense of kinship. That's the ballroom. That's where we're all headed in this city. And that's the hope, anyway. I remember Cesar Chavez was uh, 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 doing an interview with a reporter, and the interview said to him, wow, the farm workers sure love you. And he looked at him and he said, it's mutual. <laughs> That's what we hope for, it seems to me, is a sense of mutuality in this. No us and them, just us. It's not about service provider and service recipient. We always have to move way beyond that. I remember there was a homie named Caesar. We all called him Dreamer, and he grew up in Pico Gardens uh, housing projects. And I'd known him since he was a little mococito in the projects and uh, knucklehead and into gangs and into selling drugs and getting high. And, and I found him so many jobs over the years. And then he would sort of sometimes just gravitate back to, to the previous lifestyle. He'd, he'd relapse. So he came to me after a year stretch in prison, and he wanted some help. And uh, he said, it'll be different this time. Homies say this a lot. And uh, so I, I called a friend of mine who runs a uh, vending machine company in Alhambra. And he hired Dreamer right on the spot. And Dreamer has sort of a dangerous sense of humor, a thing I've gotten used to over the years. And he, he comes back to me two weeks later. And he's waving his paycheck. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. <laughs> yeah, my jefita, my mom, she's not ashamed of me, and my kids, they're proud of me, and, well, you know who I have to thank for this job. I said, well, who? And, and he looked at me strangely, he said, well, God, of course. I said, oh, sure. <laughs> no, 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 of course, of course, God. And he looked at me, he said, you thought I was going to say you, didn't you? And I said, no, God. Said, of course, God's number one, you know, and... He said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. And I'm sorry, them Genesis days? And he said, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, I mean, he told me, you know, and, uh, and we just fell out of our chairs and suddenly kinship so quickly, mutuality, not service provider, service recipient. Part of our task, I think, in our passion to love the city is to choose to become what the late uh, Alice Miller, child psychologist, calls enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. And in the process, you get returned to yourself. Can't help it. The task is not to hold the bar up and ask anybody to measure up, but to show up and to hold the mirror up and tell people the truth, knowing that your truth is their truth. It's the same truth. It's mutual. And the truth is this. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch people become that truth and inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it is just that huge. And so we start to have and to teach a certain kind of light grasp on life that can put first things recognizably first. Uh, 
parentheses. I was reading this week uh, the profile on the Dalai Lama in the New Yorker, maybe some of you read it, and uh, the reporter asked him about his own death and he just says, change of clothing. <laughs> I want what he's having. I just think that's so great. Um, it also, parentheses, within a parentheses, they, they had a, a, a recounted an interview with Oprah Winfrey and the, <laughs> the Dalai Lama, and she says to him, uh, so would you say that the whole world should meditate? And the Dalai Lama thinks, and he goes, hmm, stupid question. <laughs> I love that. I, who has not wanted to say that to Oprah? Anyway, end of parenthesis. So as you have a light grasp on life, you also want to help folks who have a hard time, who avert their eyes when you hold the mirror up and tell them the truth of who they are. The principal suffering of the poor throughout history is not that they you know, couldn't completar la renta or to come up with $20 to buy a package of Pampers. The principal suffering of the poor is shame and disgrace. So part of our task, as we have this passion for the city and we want to create a community of kinship, is to reach in and help dismantle messages of shame and disgrace. None of it's true, so you want to dismantle it. I'm in 25 different detention facilities where I um, say mass on a rotating basis in all the probation camps and juvenile halls and uh, youth authority facilities. And then because I know everybody at Dolores Mission where I was pastor for a number of years, I, I race home. And, uh, and, and then it's a steady diet, diet every Saturday. I do a couple masses in a probation camp and then I come home and it's baptisms at one and uh, you know, quinceaneras at two and wedding at three and exorcism at four and <laughs> just checking to see if you're still listening to me. <laughs> anyway, I've never done one of those. Anyway, so I, I race home one day and I have 20 minutes to my baptism at one and, and so I go to my office, I'm gonna say, I wanna go through my mail just by myself. And I'm going through my mail and as I'm doing this, suddenly this woman barges through the door. Her name, I find out, is Lisa. She's about 34 years old. And she, this is the first time she's ever decided to step uh, through the doors of my office. Uh, and now I have seven minutes before my baptism at one. And I've seen her around. She's kind of famous. She's a heroin addict, a prostitute, street person, uh, gang member, a parolee. Um, something of a famous gritona, she's always screaming, this was in her old office, you could hear her scream as they throw her out of the bar next door to our office, or, or she'd be on a payphone screaming, just let me stay tonight, pleading with family members or friends. And this is the first time she's chosen to walk into my office. And she comes right in and she sits down and she launches right in, I need help. So I've been to like 50 rehabs. I'm known all over, nationwide. <laughs> I went to Catholic schools all my life, she says. Elementary, went to Sacred Heart High School in Lincoln Heights. And then she gets quiet and still. In fact, the first time I used heroin was right after I graduated. And I've been trying to stop since the moment I began. And I watched as she leaned her head against the wall and her eyes became like two ponds, water rising to meet its edges, spilling over. And she cried and she cried until she levered, leveled her eyes at me and she said with great deliberation, I am a disgrace. And suddenly her shame met mine because when I saw her walk through my doors that afternoon, I had mistaken her for an interruption. It's mutual. It has to be mutual. Surface is the hallway, but we want to get to the ballroom. Some context. Uh, Homeboy Industries has been around for almost a quarter of a century and started when I was a pastor at Dolores Mission and we had uh, eight gangs and two huge housing projects. That was not typical in those days. I buried my first young person in 1988. I buried my 169th two weeks ago. A young man uh, headed to my office at seven in the morning. 
waiting for a bus. His name was Irvin. We did a lot of things in those days. We started a school and then homie said if only we had jobs and then we tried to find felony friendly employers in the factories that surrounded the projects and that was not as forthcoming as you would hope. So um, in 1992 we started Homeboy Bakery and then uh, a month later we started uh, Homeboy Tortillas and once we had two businesses we came up with the highfalutin Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this uh, venture. And, and now we're, uh, people say, the largest uh, gang rehab center in the United States of America. We get 12,000 folks walk through our doors uh, every year seeking services, free tattoo removal, three laser machines, 12 doctors, 4,000 treatments a year, huge mental health component, uh, case managers, job developers who try to still seek employment in the private sector. Uh, a huge menu of curricular things from anger management to parenting and many 50 other things. And then our five businesses, the solar panel training program. Uh, we also have, uh, we're in 12 farmers markets at the moment uh, on our way to 36, that's our goal. And um, Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, who printed your shirts uh, today. And uh, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff. And, and Homegirl Cafe. Uh, I hope you'll come and visit. We're just two blocks away. Or we're women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude. We'll gladly take your order. <laughs> My favorite story in the last three months is uh, Diane Keaton visited us, the Oscar-winning actress and movie star, about three months ago. And she had never been to Homeboy Industries before. And uh, she came with a regular guy who's there once a week. And her waitress this day is Glinda, and Glinda, you know, homegirl, been there, done that, prison, tattooed, um, gang member, does not know who Diane Keaton is. So she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And, um, and, I, uh, and Glinda says, well, you know, she names off three plates that she particularly likes. And then Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one there. And then something dawns on Glinda, she looks at Diane Keaton, she says, wait a minute, you seem so familiar to me, like I know you, or like I've met you, and, and Diane Keaton sort of deflects it, oh gosh, I don't know, I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And then Glenda goes, no, now I know, we were locked up together. <laughs> and suddenly kinship so quickly. Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress. <laughs> it's mutual. It's mutual. Uh, as a kid, I remember there was a mantra that uh, I kind of embraced and have to this day. It's from an old Christmas carol called, O Holy Night. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yeah, it's about Jesus, and yeah, it's about Christmas, but how is it not the job description of any passionate leader who loves L.A.? It's about appearing, and souls feel their worth. Exactly right. There was a homie I knew named Bandit who was a particularly uh, uh, difficult guy. Uh, I would ride my bike in the projects at night and then uh, uh, try to convince him to leave the sale of uh, crack cocaine. I'd watch him run up to cars and sell crack and he'd come back counting his money and he'd see me and he wasn't frankly all that embarrassed. And I'd say, how about a real job? And he'd say, no, I'm okay, gee, thanks. Very polite. Until one day, 15 years ago, he shows up in my office and, uh, and I couldn't believe he was there. And he says, I'm tired of being tired. And so I walk him to a job developer and as luck would have it, they locate uh, an entry-level, unskilled, low-pay, first kind of job at a warehouse. And, and now cut to 15 years later, today, Bandit uh, is running the place. He's el mero chingon of the whole warehouse. He's supervisor uh, Magnus. And uh, he owns his own home and is married and has three kids. And uh, so I hadn't heard from him actually for a couple years. Uh, and no news is usually good news with gang members. And, and, but he calls me one day on a Friday late uh, in the afternoon, and he's kind of breathless and paniqueado, as we say in Spanish. He says, gee, you got to bless my daughter. Que pasó, Michael? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? Go, oh, no, no. 
On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine, my oldest, my Jessica. She's going to college. But she's a little chaparita and we're all afraid for her because that's far, that's way up north and she's moving away. Could you give her like a bendicion before she leaves? And I said, oh, of course. Why don't you come tomorrow to the church at 12.30? I have baptisms at one. We'll do a little send off. And right at 12.30, Bandit and his wife and the three kids, including Jessica, show up. And I situate them in front of the altar. And I, I said, let's surround her with ourselves and our love. And everybody touch her, connect to her. Arms, shoulders, put your hands on her head. Everybody touch her. I said, well, close your eyes and bow your heads. And, and as the homies would say, I do a long ass prayer. I go on and on. And, <laughs> and somewhere in the middle of this prayer, I notice that we've all become chiones. We're all, we're all sniffling. We're all crying. I don't know why we're crying except for the fact that Bandon and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me. Certainly nobody uh, in their own families. So, you know, I kind of wipe my tears and we all kind of laugh about how mushy we got, you know, and unexpectedly. And I, I look at Jessica and I say, so what are you gonna study at Humboldt College? She was very quick, forensic psychology. Oh, damn, forensic psychology. <laughs> And Bandit chimes in, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. <laughs> and Jessica, very deadpan, turns to her father and does one of these, you know, and, and he sees her and says, yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. <laughs> so we walk up to the car in Big Abrazos and they all pile in, but Bandit hangs back. And I said, Miko, can I tell you something? Uh, I give you credit uh, for the man you've chosen to become for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes well up with tears and he says, Sabes que, I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life. A bueno para nada. I guess I showed him. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth exactly what God had in mind. And suddenly the circle of compassion widens and somebody who was outside feels inside. One last story. Um, I was in a bookstore the other day and I was uh, noticing uh, Laura Bush's uh, memoir and uh, I flipped through it, I didn't buy it, but I flipped through it and uh, <laughs> Um, and, and I noticed that Homeboy Industries had three pages inside the book, so I read it and it was quite effusive uh, and, and very nice uh, uh, mention. And that's because uh, Laura Bush visited Homeboy uh, about five years ago in a previous re regime that some of you might recall. And uh, she was first lady and she was traveling around the country going to after school programs, mentoring programs, and, and she came to Homeboy Industries, the only gang intervention rehab center uh, that she visited in the country. And the Secret Service thought, uh, we can't really do this at the headquarters because it's too porous. You couldn't secure it. And so they went to Homeboy Silkscreen, which is located on Olympic and uh, uh, near Santa, uh, Santa Fe and Olympic. And, um, and only 50 people could be a part of this uh, visit. And on the day of the visit, there were bomb sniffing dogs and sharpshooters on the roofs of all the surrounding factories. Sharpshooters inside the building in the rafters aimed at the homies. I have no idea what they thought the homies would do to this woman, but they were <laughs> awfully prepared. And, uh, and so about uh, three weeks before the visit, a very severe looking Clint Eastwood type head of Secret Service came to me and said, Father, I'm going to need uh, the names of the 50 people who are going to be shaking hands with the First Lady part of this visit. I'm going to need their names. I'm going to need their birth dates. I'm going to need their social security numbers. So we decided to declare undocumented worker day off day on that day. <laughs> you guys come maybe the following day. And, and so I typed up this list dutifully and I handed it to this Clint Eastwood guy and, and two days later he's in my office looking more severe than I had previously seen him. He said, wow, yeah, father, um, <clears throat> these people have records, he says to me. Like this news might come as a surprise to me, you know, and I, and I said, well, at Homeboy Industries, it's sort of the idea, you know. So I had to negotiate two guys who apparently their resumes were too long, you know, so 
<laughs> but anyway, uh, the meeting, uh, the visit went off without a hitch, and it was really, you know, uh, she was a very nice lady. The homies felt, and homegirls felt quite good about themselves. Well, about three months later, I get a phone call from a staffer at the White House, and she says, uh, Mrs. Bush is sponsoring a conference, a national conference, called Helping America's Youth, and it'll be at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and the First Lady would like you to speak at it. I said, I'd be honored to. Oh, by the way, the woman says, uh, Mrs. Bush would like you to bring three homies with you. <laughs> now, whether the First Lady actually used the H word, I can't be certain. And then she said, afterwards, a select group of participants will be invited into the White House for dinner. Now, certainly crooks have resided in this house before. <laughs> but it may well be the first time gang members have ever stepped foot in there. So, um, so I picked, you know, the three most menacing members of my organization <laughs> just to mess with the White House a little bit. Who could, who could blame me for this, you know? So, so I picked Gabriel, Gus, and Herbie. You guys have been to prison and tattooed and been there, done that, and you wouldn't want to meet them in a dark alley or even an extremely lit one, you know? So, so I call them in. I say, look, we're going to the White House for dinner. You guys can't be wearing size 85 waist dickies, you know? So we got to get us some suits. So, so we go to men's warehouse, you know? You're going to like the way you look, I guarantee it. <laughs> that guy was not there, however. And... Uh, so we go to the one in Burbank, and, and we um, you know, walk in, and I swear to you, every single solitary salesperson rushes us out the door as if to say, now how may we help the three of you leave our store as quickly as possible? I go, well, we're going to be needing three suits. We're going to the White House for dinner. Like I said, yeah, right. So uh, he dispatches them into dressing rooms. I'm out there looking through ties. And, um, and the first of our group comes out, Gabriel, and, and he's... Um, in a perfectly fitted gray suit, and he's standing in front of a six-sided mirror, and he's just staring at himself with his mouth wide open. Now, Gabriel, um, uh, about 25 years old at the time, he doesn't work for us anymore, got a better job, which we always hope for, covered with tattoos, um, uh, undergone like 37 laser treatments. His whole name of his gang is uh, blackened on his neck. Uh, his 37 laser treatments, they're painful. He needs like 96 more and he'll be good to go, you know, so. Um, and he did a lot of things in those days. He was a supervisor of our part-time workers, but he mainly gave tours. He was our premier tour guide. So he'd greet you at the door with his million-dollar smile. And he'd introduce you to the job developers. And he'd hand you goggles so you could watch tattoos being removed on the premises. Hand you a hairnet so you could walk into the bakery and watch enemy gang members baking bread together. He'd take you into the cafe and tell you what his favorite dishes are. I gave great tours. He has about the purest, most innocent, golden heart of anybody I think I've ever met in my life, though the packaging might suggest otherwise. The day won't ever come when I have more courage or I'm more noble or I'm closer to God than this guy, Gabriel. So I walk up to him and I tap him on his shoulder and I say, are you okay? And he doesn't take his eyes off the guy in the mirror. And he says, damn, gee, I'm already pinching myself. Like he can't believe he's in a suit, can't believe he's headed to the White House. Well, I bought the tickets months in advance. Well, about two weeks before we're scheduled to leave, I don't know what compelled me, I called Gabriel in and I said, hey, did you ask permission of your parole officer to go to the White House? He said, of course I did. Oh, good, you know, I'm just checking. Yeah, she said no. I go, Gabriel, <laughs> when were you going to get around to telling me this? He went, I wasn't going to tell you. I was afraid you wouldn't let me go. Like, like an innocent kid, you know, and I said, well, give me your number. And with him sitting there, I call this woman. I give the spiel, White House conference, suits, first lady, dinner. And she says, nope, high control. High control parole, which you know means sort of a, cer a certain kind of hypervigilance. I said, could I speak to your supervisor? She transfers me. I do the spiel one more time. The guy says, no way. He's a high control parolee. I said, is there somebody like a notch, you know, above you? And, and so they send me to the notch guy. And, and this guy says, let me be really clear. This guy's not leaving the state of California. He's a high control parolee. And they all seem to be having a real bad case of, and Gabriel, who exactly did you think you are that you get to 
go to the White House. Well, suddenly faxes and phone calls and uh, emails from the White House and the Department of Justice and the First Lady's office, and then what may well be the singular accomplishment of the Bush administration, we get permission. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. We, I couldn't help myself, couldn't help myself. We get permission to go to the White House. You know, we were going to go anyway, but I find permission is preferable. So on, on the day that we left, it was mishap after mishap. Uh, the homies were late, and then so it put us in bumper to bumper traffic on the way to LAX. I turned to nobody in particular, and I say, "Hey, did all of you remember to bring your IDs?" Calladito silence. A lone voice from the back seat. Shit. It's. Gus, he's forgotten his ID, so we have to go back. And we left on a Tuesday, and we stayed with my brother and his wife in D.C., and then we did tourist things Tuesday and Wednesday. Well, Thursday's the day of the suits, the day of the conference, the day of the White House, the day of the dinner. And it was there on that day in the early morning of Thursday that we discovered that apparently Gabriel, poor old Gabriel, as he's running to my car that Tuesday in the early morning darkness with his bag slung over one shoulder and his men's warehouse suit, covered in plastic, open at the bottom. And as he's running to my car, the movement jostles the pants and they slither off the hanger and they fall unbeknownst to him somewhere on the sidewalk or in the gutter. And some homeless man is liking the way he looks, I guarantee it. <laughs> and I can hear this plaintive cry in my brother's house. I don't got no pants. So God love my sister-in-law, she jerry-rigged a pair of my brother's pants, and he looked fine, nobody knows. So we go to the conference and we walk into the White House, three gang members covered in tattoos, in their suits and ties. And there are butlers walking the halls with trays of long-stemmed glasses of white wine. And the homies are snatching those puppies as quickly as they can, you know. And, and we go into the red room and the blue room and the green room, and every room has a sort of an elegant combo and a string quartet and a brass band, elegant. And the gold room has the food, and it's just completely gourmet, and never in my life have I tasted food quite like this. Went back like eight times, you know, and rack of lamb, magnificent perfection of salmon the size of Wisconsin. There were every imaginable kind of food, and I'm standing there with Gabriel at one point, and he eyeballs these long white potatoes cut lengthwise with a hole carefully bore out in the middle, stuffed with caviar and a sprig of chive. And he pops that sucker in his mouth. spits it out in a napkin. This shit tastes nasty, he says. <laughs> and for the teachers among you, let's just say he wasn't using his inside voice at the time. <laughs> and was it me or did the Secret Service lunge ever so slightly at precisely that moment? So anyway, I told you all that to tell you this. The next day we're flying home and we're mid-country and Gabriel says, I gotta go to the baño. I said, well, Mick was at the back of the plane. 45 minutes later, he comes back and he said, Mijo, you know, que paso? I, I thought you fell in, okay. <laughs> oh, I was just talking to that lady back there. And I turn around and I see the flight attendant standing at the back of the plane. And then he says, I made her cry, I hope that's okay. I go, Gabriel, it might depend on what you actually said to the woman. <laughs> Well, you know, she saw all my tattoos and she saw my homeboy industry shirt. I don't know. She asked me a gang of questions. So I gave her a tour of the office. At 34,000 feet, Gabriel walks this woman through the office, introduces her to the job developers, hands her goggles so she can watch tattoos being removed, gives her a hairnet so she can see enemy rival gang members bake bread together. And I told her last night we made history. For the first time in the history of this country, three gang members walked into the White House. We had dinner there. I told her the food tasted nasty. <laughs> and she cried. I said, well, Gabriel, what you expect, Michael? She just caught a glimpse of you. She saw that you are somebody. She recognized you as the shape of God's heart. People cry sometimes when they see that. 
And suddenly kinship so quickly, two souls feeling their worth, flight attendant, gang member, 34,000 feet. It's mutual. Our passion for the city is meant for one thing, that one day we might be one. No us and them, just us. And yeah, maybe there are some things you can't reach, but you can reach out to them. And all day long, for the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, we wait for it. Thank you very much.